There is one incident in the Gospel of Mark that I've always found kind of fascinating. And I'm not the only one. People have debated for centuries about the meaning of the appearance of the young man in the Garden of Gethsemane wearing only a linen cloth who then runs off naked. This incident is mentioned in none of the other Gospels, but it certainly stands out in its distinctiveness in this one, so much so that people find they can't ignore it. And so this has led to all kinds of speculation. Some people suggest, for example, that perhaps this is meant to be an appearance of the author, Mark himself, in the Gospel. That the author is saying that he was there, historically or maybe symbolically. It's an interesting idea, but there's really no evidence that that is who it is supposed to be. Other people have noted that this appearance of the young man might be symbolic of the early Christian practice of baptism. Apparently, it was the common practice in the earliest church uh, for candidates to present themselves for baptism dressed in white linen cloths. And then after the baptism had been completed, the robe would be stripped off and the newly baptized person would leave in the nude, kind of like a symbol of new birth. Again, very interesting idea. I'm not going to suggest that it's a practice we ought to revive, though. People have also noted the odd resemblance between this young man in the garden and the man who appears, described identically, in the tomb of Jesus at the end of the Gospel. That doesn't seem like a coincidence. Maybe Mark wanted us to make a connection. So, there's been a lot of speculation, but no clear answer. So I set out to try and figure it out. What is this streaker doing in the garden? And scholars have, of course, written a lot about this person over the years. So I did a fair bit of reading, and some of it was quite helpful. There was this one paper that I found in which the scholar argued that this young man in, who appears in the story is there as comic relief. And after reading that paper, I, I, I think I kind of agree. I think he might be there to make us laugh. But do you want to know what the funniest part about that paper was? The scholar took 14 pages of dense theological and literary argument to come to the conclusion that this episode was meant to be comic relief. And I don't know... I just feel that if it takes that long to explain a joke, you kind of have to wonder how funny it is. This paper also argued, and I found this very helpful, that the key word in the story may be the first verb, was following. As in, a certain young man was following him. See, that word is very important because it is a key word that is repeated often in the Gospel of Mark. Following, it might be argued, is the most important thing anyone, except for Jesus, does in this Gospel. The choice to follow Jesus is what makes disciples into disciples. And that would also seemingly include the women who are said to have followed Jesus up to Jerusalem. So, the mere fact that this youth is following Jesus puts him in some pretty important company. Ah, but there's more. You see, Mark also uses a very intensive form of the verb, a form that essentially means to follow closely. And he only uses that particular word for following one other time in this gospel. 
And that refers to an occasion when three of the, the key disciples, Peter, James, and John, <coughs> are following Jesus closely into the home of Jairus. This suggests a very close connection with Jesus. And then there is the tense of the verb. And I know we don't usually get into the tense of Greek verbs, but let's make an exception this once. The verb is in the imperfect tense in the, in the original Greek. Now that refers to an action that happened in the past, but that happened continuously. In other words, it's made clear that this youth does not just follow Jesus once on this one occasion, no. This is something that he has been doing for some time. It could also refer to a habitual practice. It might even be saying that he was kind of obsessed with following Jesus. And all of that makes me suspect that Mark does not want us to underestimate the importance of this young man or to think of this incident in isolation. That we need to see this as an essential part of the overall narrative of the gospel. And maybe we are meant to wonder, well, where else this young man's following might have intersected with the story of Jesus as told in Mark's gospel. So I'd just like to explore that a little bit. Imagine, imagine that you are the next person in line to be baptized by John the Baptist when Jesus goes down into the water. Even though this place out by the Jordan River is far away from any human settlement, people have come here from Jerusalem and all Judea to hear what the Baptist has to say and to receive his baptism of repentance. And of course, nobody wants to be baptized by one of John's disciples. <laughs> no, they've come all this way. They want the authentic experience. And so the people wait in line for hours to get their few minutes in the river with John. But when Jesus is baptized, everything grinds to a halt. Some say that the clouds in the sky are ripped apart. And when a dove flies down from a nearby tree, they read that as an omen as well. And there are even some who insist that they hear a rumble of thunder which others identify as the voice of God. But whatever signs each one sees, however they interpret those signs, there is an immediate consensus that there is something different about this Jesus. Even John falls silent as he stares at the man he just baptized walking out of the stream. And if you know anything about John the Baptist, that, that is a wonder all its own. And you are there. You are the next in line after Jesus. You've come out from a town in Judea. Ever since you heard what John is doing out here at the Jordan, you have been intent on coming. Well, you even purchased a linen cloth, a, a symbol of the repentance and a new beginning that John's baptism represents. And you have it wrapped tight around your body. And now, as you come to stand before John in the stream, John, whose mind is still trying to process what has just happened with Jesus, kind of robotically goes through the motions of baptizing you. Does not go as you had imagined. But you don't mind. You don't mind in the least. Because you, like everyone else, you are totally focused on the man who was just baptized before you. And so, as you come up out of the water, 
without even pausing to take your possessions with you, you set out following Jesus as he climbs the riverbank, heading out towards the wilderness. And now, now it is later. It's hard to say exactly how much later. The timeline in Mark's gospel is far from clear. But a lot has happened. And all this time you have followed Jesus, followed him as closely as you can. Now you're not one of those disciples that people talk about. You're no Peter or James or Mary Magdalene. But you've listened to everything that he has taught. You've tried to do your best to follow. When, for example, Jesus had that encounter with the rich young ruler who wanted to know how he could enter the kingdom of God and and Jesus said to him, go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. The rich young ruler, he couldn't handle that demand. He chose not to follow. But you did. Now, you didn't necessarily have a whole lot to sell and give away, but you gave what you could. You gave what you had. And if it left you wearing little more than a linen cloth wrapped around your naked body, you're okay with that. And now, now the whole group has come up to Jerusalem. And things have been looking bad for about a week. And when you are all together in the Garden of Gethsemane, it all comes to a head. There's an entire crowd, all of them carrying swords and clubs sent by the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and they are coming for him. This is finally it. This is the great test of what it means to follow Jesus. And as you stand there trembling in terror, you look to the big-name disciples. You look to Peter and James and John, And you see them shaking with the same fear that you feel. But surely, surely you think to yourself, as terrifying as this whole situation is, they will not abandon him. He called them to follow him. And that means even at moments like this, maybe especially at moments like this, But as you stand there, mouth agape, they do it. They break. And they run in every direction. They're gone. And you stand there amazed, still terrified. Is it possible? Will you be the only one and you... And you feel the sense of determination coming over you. Yes. Yes, you will follow. Even now, especially now. And so as they start to drag him off, you move with determination to follow him closely. And he turns. And for a moment, he he catches your eye. And in that moment, you understand that he sees you. That he knows your commitment, your love for him. He knows that you'd follow him anywhere. And he nods his head in in a blessing. But then he shakes it just a little bit. But you understand that he's saying to you, that here you cannot follow. Not yet. And at that moment, one of the ruffians in the crowd notices you there trying to follow, and and there's a cry, and 
Hands reach out and grab your loosely wound linen cloth. And you turn. And as you turn, you feel the cloth unwinding. And in a moment, you are free. <laughs> you are running naked in the garden. And the men cry out, mocking you, cursing you. But perhaps unsurprisingly, none seems inclined to set out in pursuit. You are free. Maybe freer than ever before. And you know that as you, as you run, there are all kinds of things you should be feeling. You should feel the shame of public indecency. You should feel the humiliation of being on display, but you feel none of that. Because you just let go of your last possession on the earth. And you feel as if every weight has dropped away. You feel as if you are newborn into the world. The next couple of days are difficult. There's no place you can go where they will not reject you. You dare not go into the city or, or any settled habitation. You end up walking in the pathless wilderness, finding a place to sleep in the hedges. And then the next days are spent wandering, wandering, always careful to avoid being seen by any passing humans. And, ascent, and eventually you are so desperate to find some shelter that late in the night you decide to head towards the burial grounds outside the city. It is very early in the morning before the sun has really started to rise. And you look around the graves. And you make out one that looks to be a newly hollowed out tomb. And amazingly, it seems to be open. The stone that would normally be placed at the entrance to keep out the wild animals, it's been rolled off to one side. Seems inviting you enter and are glad to find some shelter. And there, in the place where the body would be laid, should be laid, you find nothing but a folded white linen garment. Grateful to find something to wear at last, you take it and you, you wrap it around your body. And for the first time in days, you almost feel normal. And that's when you notice the sound of footsteps approaching. There is a small group of women coming to the tomb. And you are amazed to recognize them. For they are the women who also followed him up to Jerusalem. And as they approach... Everything kind of falls into place. It all makes sense. And in your mind, in your spirit, you know what it is you need to say to them. Who is the young man in the garden, the one who ran away naked? We may never know. But I don't think he's meant to represent the author of the gospel or any particular disciple, I think. Mark wrote him into the gospel as a stand-in for, for you, the reader. He wanted you to imagine yourself in the scene. He wanted you to ask yourself what you might have done. He wanted you to ask yourself, what would it really mean for you to follow Jesus, to truly follow him? And what would that change in your life? The young disciple is all of us, or at least all who we could be, if we truly chose to follow him closely as a habit in our lives. 
Lord, lead us. We will follow. We will follow.